chemist spirits are the cure for the common cocktail. We really looked at a wine that would go well for people who are pursuing an active and healthy lifestyle. Gin and tonic in an adult can. Dedication to our craft for over 165 years. It's no wonder that we brought this amazing liquid to the United States. The idea of aging in Cabernet Cast is very unique. Denord is a place where people feel safe, where they feel welcome, where they feel wanted. And decided to create an organic vodka through a premium lens. The recipe that is genuinely history in a bottle. We started making spirits to share our appreciation for quality whiskey and the Central Coast. Salute. Cheers. This wine pairs with everything. We've always loved bringing people together over great drinks because we know that cocktails are the ultimate social connector. Pink Pig is a premium Añejo Cristalino that is shattering expectations. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tequila and Mezcal uh, competition in the 2021 WSA. WSWA brand battle. This is the alcohol industry's premier pitch competition. Um, my name is Elaine Duff and I have the pleasure of being your host today. Um, for those of you uh, who I have never had the pleasure of meeting, uh, I've been working in this industry for over 20 years. I'm an entree consultant and educator for my company Duff on the Rocks, as well as the founder and creator of the Beverage Brand Ambassador Academy, uh, the first online training academy for brand ambassadors. And uh, most people know me as uh, the head mixologist, uh, I used to be the head mixologist for Diageo, uh, as well as their uh, luxury spirits ambassador. So enough about me, let's get to our sponsors. So we want to give a big shout out to our head sponsor, which is 750 Beverage Media. Um, they are our media sponsor who has helped promote this tournament and also engage with a lot of the contenders and the winners following the tournament. Um, they have been uh, longtime supporters of the WSWA and its various programs, and we are really thankful for their continued support. Uh, and our other tournament sponsors include the Beverage Brand Ambassador Academy, the Cocktail Guru, London Essence, uh, the Gap Promotions, the Wine, the Win Wine Industry Network, and Lo and No uh, Beverage Summit. All right, so today we are going to hear from six different tequila and mezcal companies who will spend a few minutes presenting their products. And after each presentation, the judges are gonna spend a few minutes asking their questions and giving feedback. Um, I encourage all of you that are watching uh, to add in your questions through the chat box, which is below. Uh, we try to answer all your questions as they come through during the tournament. And at the end of today's competition, we will announce the category winner from our judges' voice uh, votes, as well as the people's choice winner from this category from all of your uh, votes. So, uh, and anybody tuning in today's competition. So the judges' choice winner will then move on to the championship and a championship round in September. So please make sure to vote. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our esteemed panel of judges participating today. Together, this wholesale group uh, represents businesses varying from sizes from across the country, bringing in over a hundred years of combined experiences and expertise in the wine and spirits industry. These leaders are always looking for the next and up and coming brands. So let me introduce the judges. So we're gonna start with Ray from, first up from Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits, we have Ray Lombard, uh, who has recently promoted to the executive vice president and general manager of Craft Spirits. Uh, congratulations, Ray. Uh, in his current role, Mr. Lombard is in charge of providing strategy for Southern Glazers Craft Spirits uh, portfolio. He oversees the company's new Craft Spirits division across the country, leading all Craft Spirits sales and support functions as part of Southern Glazers. Um, they also new Southern uh, SG and enhanced customer service, fine wine and craft spirits category. And in addition to these responsibilities, Mr. Lombard manages the craft spirits division where he onboards 
uh, helps onboard uh, contacts, management, marketing, performance, and directs Southern Glacier's highly successful fleet advertising program. Next from Winebow, uh, we have Monique uh, Hudson, um, the VP of Wholesale Spirits Portfolio. Monique, uh, I have a, a pleasure of knowing uh, and such interesting background. She has a career of over two decades where over two decades ago, she was the uh, person in charge of building and educating uh, within the company called Dundee, Dundee Dell in oh, sorry, Omaha, Nebraska, where it had the largest whiskey and spirits collection in the world. And Monique was in charge of that. And as an avid spokesperson and educator, uh, Monique has served as a spirits judge and a panelist at events and competitions around the world and has been featured in Whiskey Advocate, Advocate <laughs> Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal. Welcome, Monique. Um, next to her is David Rosenberg, who is the vice president from Hartley Parker. Um, David is the vice president and owner of Hartley Parker and Limited, a statewide distribution company of wine and spirits based in Connecticut. As a third generation owner, David strives for greatness and increasing dynamic and a competitive market through a strong work ethic and challenging the status quo. Currently, David is working on his MBA in Cornell University. Uh, next to him is Ken Kodis. Uh, Ken is the craft and luxury spirit specialist. Ken really launched his career uh, while entering in being very successful, entering, entering into cocktail competitions, uh, which then furthered his career as a consultant, uh, where he's then pursued his education, getting his WSET level two, as well as the bar five day course. And now he works as the beverage director, uh, working from the beverage director side. Now he's on the distributor side where he partners with suppliers and brings that consultant point of view to his customers. Next to him is Ivy Anderson. Uh, Ivy uh, Anderson is from Southern. Uh, she is the wine and spirits manager at Southern Eagle Distributing. Ivy is a certified sommelier based in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Ivy's love of wine and spirits hospitality started working in restaurants in Charleston prior to Southern Eagle. Uh, and last but not least is Nick Demijohn, uh, the director of Origin Bever uh, Beverage. Uh, Nick is the, currently he's the director of Origin Beverage, a sales and marketing subsidiary of Horizon Beverage Group. And he manages the brands within Origin Beverage while overseeing a sales team that covers the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Nick really put his mark on his career when he doubled their amount of accounts, when he really expanded their amount of accounts by doubling their sales team. Um, and prior to that, he was the first sales rep actually ever hired for Origin. And he spent five years calling on accounts in the greater Boston area. Um, so thank you all for the participating judges for today's, uh, for all you judges for participating in today's competition. I really do look forward to hearing all your feedback on our contenders and their products. Now let's get to the registered contenders. All right, so starting, uh, we have, so as I'm sure you all know, right? So the Kila industry is extremely competitive right now. Um, there are many new and unique products that are on the marketplace. So we are really excited to hear from these six impressive companies who were selected to talk about their products representing a wide variety of emerging brands. The contenders we're gonna hear from today are Tequila Camusario, uh, Mezcal Joven Kerem Mucho, Tequila Honor, Tequila Mico, The Pink Pig, and Tequila Mandala. All right, so now that you know your players, let's get started. So please welcome our first contender of the tournament, Sobir Singh. He's from Miko Tequila. It's a new classic modern spirit crafted with respect to the legacy of world-class tequila. Take it away, Sabir, and tell us more about your new classic tequila. Sabir, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your camera, that would be great. You guys good now? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. Hi, how's everybody doing today? My name is Sabir Singh. I'm the co-founder and president of Nico Tequila. 
I'm here today to tell you about this phenomenal tequila and, and the story behind it. It actually starts back in Fiji, where my family's from. Um, in the mid 1980s, uh, my family and I migrated to Los Angeles, where I grew up, and being a career in the spirits industry, working for companies such as Patron, Remy Cointreau, and Moat Hennessy for over 14 years. Uh, my father, AJ, the founder of the company, got an interesting background, was actually hired by Martin Crowley, the founder of Patron, to bring production in the house, uh, build what today is their hacienda, and oversee their parent company. Um, AJ, my father, found himself living in Guadalajara for almost eight years, where he fell in love with tequila and, and the Mexican culture itself. While he was down there, him and I were very close friends. I used to travel down there very much, and I actually fell in love with tequila as well. Um, during his time in uh, Guadalajara and the small town of Antonio where Patron was then being produced, uh, he met Juan and Antonio Nunez from Tequila El Mejito. Uh, the Nunez family have been producing tequila in the highlands of Jalisco for 76 years now. And the three of them became very, very close friends. Uh, Karina Rojo is our master distiller. She's one of the very few female master distillers in the state of Jalisco, a fact that we're very proud of. And the Nunez family have been producing some very authentic tequila again for many years. So when my father and I sat down to develop kind of plan and um, create a partnership behind Miko and who produced that, the Nunez family was just a natural fit for us given the relationship and, and what they really do. Um, Juan, uh, Juan, Karina, and AJ, and myself, work very closely to create each, each batch of Miko, um, given everybody's relationship within the industry, with agave farmers and whatnot. Um, we leverage our relationships to, to make sure we're, we're sourcing the highest quality products and we're using traditional authentic methods that have been passed out for generation to generation. Uh, what's really unique is when you get into our Reposado and our Anejo. Uh, we're aging our Reposado first in ex Tennessee whiskey cask, but we also went out to two sought after wineries in Napa Valley, Napa and Alexander Valley um, to, to finish them off. So Reposado is finished off in Cabernet Cast from Silver Oak Winery in Napa Valley. Uh, we then went over to our friends at Woodford Reserve in Kentucky to age our Anejo, which aged up to 15 months in ex bourbon whiskey cast. They are then finished off in Cabernet Cast from Alexander Valley from Jordan Winery, another very steep uh, full body Cabernet. Um, we feel like because the two are very distinct, it really sets us apart from everything else on the market today. And given Karina's background and just her expertise and her palate for tequila, it really resonates with our core millennial female centric consumer. Um, if you look at our packaging, it's very vibrant. We have a very authentic traditional method of producing tequila, but we feel like this, this millennial consumer, whether not whether what industry they come from, whether it's fashion, uh, tech, design, is really looking for something discerning, something that sticks out. And we feel like Miko really breaks through the clutter uh, on the on back bar and on shelves. Uh, Miko as a brand um, stands actually for monkey in Spanish and uh, in the state of Jalisco. And we really wanted to have fun with it. I mean, the co-founders of the partners are really uh, serious about tequila and how to produce great quality tequila. At the same time, we feel the brand needs to be fun and again, really kind of embrace this millennial consumer. Um, and Bear, you have 30 seconds. To it's see. one of confidence, um, mischievousness, uh, and we feel like uh, the brand itself is, is one that, that works really well. Um, Miko uh, is something that we feel is really poised to resonate well in the US market, and um, we're really excited to be here. Miko. Morning, Lisco, raised in LA. Thank you for your time. <laughs> well done. All right, judges, time's up. So uh, thank you so much, Sabir. Uh, now let's bring back our panel of judges for some Q&A. Let's start with Ray from Southern Glazers. Ray, what are your questions and feedback for Sabir? Thank you, Lane. Um, so reading up on the uh, profile is, is referencing your female uh, distiller. And there was wondering, uh, you know, what's the what's uh, the involvement, and what's the uh, the uh, artisanal angle and the heritage angle that that the brand will have uh, nowadays. Uh, you know, this was predominantly a male-dominated industry, and um, having women entering the industry is bringing a new a new category of uh, consumer. It's bringing a lot of attention to the category, and it's something new and exciting, and it's also an evolution of the industry. So with that, um, is, how are you gonna be positioning your, your female distiller and and uh, what's the, uh, to what scale is, is the distiller involved? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question, especially that with, that with everything that's taken place over the last three to five years with women in the workforce. I mean, what's, what's nice about Karina, what's interesting about Karina is she's been with the family for 16 years. And my father and her have, have had a great relationship um, and he really respects her judgment and whatnot. I think for us, because it's such a natural fit, um, and she's got such a great talent and uh, an ability to create very exceptional tequila. It's simple for us. We just need to amplify that message and connect to that poor millennial consumer. You know, we, we, when we look at Miko Tequila, we look at uh, the female market. You know, there's a lot of brands that launch, um, whether it's vodkas or tequilas that are maybe 35% and they could be flavored. We really think that there's a lot of female consumers out there looking for something authentic and want to drink tequila the same way our, their male counterparts do. And we feel like Karina could be a phenomenal gap for that to kind of explore and to tell that message. Great. Uh, so I was going to ask if any uh, person watching before you go on, Sabira, I was going to say, and um, we get to the next judge, if anybody watching has any questions, please throw them in the chat right now. Um, we'd love, love to hear from you. Um, Ray, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. And then uh, as far as the story behind the uh, the logo, the name, as well as what the uh, potential for scalability is for the brand. Um, you know, what's your production capabilities? So what's great is, and as, as I mentioned, being that AJ, uh, the co-founder of this company was instrumental in taking Patron from 100,000 cases in 1999 to 2.2 million cases over eight year span. Uh, we have the ability to do about, right now, about half a million to 750,000 cases a year annually. Um, so, and that's through the LV facility, not to mention the fact that, you know, he did this while Patron was actually constructing the facility. So from a capacity standpoint and from a quality standpoint, we feel really confident we can grow and scale this brand throughout the United States. Fantastic. Ray, you good? I'm good. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> uh, before I pass it on to uh, Monique um, and ask thoughts, I also wanted to ask, uh, this is a question I got, which is uh, where did the name Miko come, come from? So the name Miko, again, stems, and it, it actually stems from the region of Jalisco where uh, it translates a long tail monkey. And it's very specific to that region. And if you go to the other parts in, 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 in throughout Mexico, there's different terms used for monkey. And again, we really wanted to have fun with this. Miko was actually a brand that Martin Crowley started in the late 1990s. And it was, and my father and Martin were very close to each other. And it was something he wanted to do if and when Patron went where it went, but Martin passed away. And the brand was very near and dear to my father. Uh, so we acquired the brand for this day. We actually updated the packaging to kind of resonate with our core consumer today. But we felt like it really resonated with us as founders, being just having fun with the brand, um, you know, being mischievous about it, the curiosity of monkeys, and that that resonates well with or kind of reflects our our ability to Asian wine cast, doing cast rings, doing things really off the beaten path within the tequila segment. And that's kind of how the that brand. Evolved. No, that's not. That's fine. We only have like fifteen seconds. Modi, do you have a very question? Quick question. Yeah, I was just, what did the conversation, how did the conversation go? I do think it's still pretty new to be using wine casts in this space. So how was that approach to Silver Oak and Jordan? How was that, that response? How did that, that, uh, that relationship happen? Yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I wish it was, it was more scientific or more, there was more to it. My father actually worked on Bordeaux at Patron, and so he was flying to Europe and things like that. And he was just really into wine casts. He just, he wanted to do something with it. And he literally just called me one day. He said, listen, I'm in Napa Valley. I'm going to Silver Oak. I'm going to a few different wineries. I'm going to buy some casts. I said, okay, good luck. And he literally, <laughs> and he literally Unfortunately, went, I have to, I have to cut you. I have to, we have to continue on to the next one. So uh, Sabir, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you for kicking us off. Now we're going into our second competitor. Um, we have uh, Autumn Chiklis and Marissa Lepore from The Pink Pig. Uh, the Pink Pig uh, is an Añejo Cristalino, uh, which is female founded and run. The Pink Pig isn't tequila for her, it's a tequila like her. So bold, ambitious, and exceptional taste. So uh, Autumn and Marissa, please tell us about your product. Hi everyone, thank you so much again to the judges and for everyone for joining us. My name is Autumn Chiklis. And I'm Marissa Lepore, and we're the co-founders of The Pink Pig. 
The Pink Pig is a premium Añejo Cristalino that we hope will change the way that you think about and experience tequila. From our vibrant colors to our unconventional brand story to our unique product and flavor profile, we're creating a brand that's unlike anything that you've seen in the tequila space. First, some background on us. I'm an author and a screenwriter, and Marissa has worked in investment banking for the last six years, focusing on scaling branded consumer businesses. And the two of us have been friends since we were in middle school. So we initially thought of the idea for the Pink Pig while out together celebrating International Women's Day in 2019. We were talking about some of the incredible and inspiring women in our lives, over margaritas, of course, and we realized that despite tequila being all of our female friends' number one drink of choice, it's mostly created by and marketed towards men. And in instances in which it was marketed for women, we didn't really feel like the brands were for us. We wanted to create something that wasn't all about being skinny or fruity. We wanted something that was empowering and feminine at the same time. So like you said, we were tired for tequila for her. So we decided to make a tequila like her, bold, ambitious, and with exceptional taste. That exceptional taste comes from the fact that our product is a Cristalino, which is being called Agave's newest superstar. Cristalino is a premium Añejo that's been filtered through activated charcoal, creating a fresh tasting aged tequila that is also crystal clear. Our tequila is aged for one year in white oak bourbon barrels before it is, being, before it is filtered, so it keeps all of those vanilla and butterscotch and toffee flavors that we love from an Añejo, but it brings back that bright tropical zest from a Blanco that we miss and crave. So it's exceptionally smooth and sippable, but it's also incredibly versatile. It's not as sweet as your average Añejo, but still maintains that, complex, that complexity and depth of flavor, so you can drink it on the rocks, you could sip it neat, but it also elevates any cocktail. So million dollar question, what is the pink pig? So when I was in preschool, I desperately wanted to sit on a pink pig pillow during reading time, but there was only one. And every day I'd return to the classroom after recess only to find that someone else had gotten it first. So after a few teary eyed nights, my mom sat me down for some life changing advice. She said, if you want that pig, it's up to you to make it happen. Take initiative, leave recess early, be first in line, basically, Set yourself up for success and then go get that pig. When Marissa told me the story, I instantly fell in love with the message. I thought it said so much about taking initiative and going after the things that you want. So what started as kind of this silly little story from preschool turned into a foundational value and metaphor in both of our lives. So throughout our friendship, whatever challenge we're facing, whatever dream we're pursuing, whatever uh, you know goal we have, we turn to each other and we go, hey, let's get that pig. So as female entrepreneurs, we're sensitive to the fact that too often women are faced with social and economic hurdles that keep their dreams out of reach. We've partnered with Grameen America, a nonprofit microfinance organization dedicated to helping entrepreneurial women living in poverty build their businesses. Grameen provides them with microloans, financial training, and support. However, supporting female entrepreneurs extends way beyond our charity partners. We also work with various women artists and photographers showcasing their work in our branding and social platforms. So where are we now? 30 seconds, just so you know. We Sorry. just received a bronze medal from the San Francisco Spirit Awards and a platinum best of class award at the SIP Awards, which is their most prestigious honor. We've officially soft launched the Pink Pig last week, which means it's available on our website, getthatpig.com. We're starting small and local, developing a loyal fan base of people who've fallen in love with our values and our product. And we're also in conversations with select boutique and alcohol retailers. As a young brand that's entirely self-funded, we're incredibly proud of how far we've come. Thank you so much again. And we hope that you're ready to get that pig. <laughs> Great job, ladies. That was fantastic. Um, now I'm going to throw it over to the judges for some Q&A. David, uh, we'll start with you. Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks, Elaine. Um, first of all, thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. It was wonderful. The tequila, the juice is wonderful. I think it's very full-bodied, very bold, but yet it's approachable. Uh, but it's important to have a full body and flavor when you're drinking at the crystalline level. Uh, and I think you guys hit that uh, out of the park. One thing I'll offer is some constructive feedback. In the bottle, the Cristalino um, category while growing is very small yet. So people are still learning about it. And your words on Yeho Cristalino on the front are very small. And since you have a clear back and not a white backing on the shelf or the back bar, it might be lost as to what exactly it is. The word tequila is pretty clear but you don't wanna be misconstrued as just a Blanco. So the Cristalina word might, if you can sell it a little bit more, I think that's really important. Um, one question I do have, and your, 
your onset and, and your purpose, your foundation for this product is both noble and, and admirable. And, and listening to the two of you speak about it from your mouths, I get the message, I get the passion, but have you given any thought as how that message will carry through the system to eventually fall on the consumer's ears, either at a bar and retail? How will they know about your whole story? Have you given some thought as, as far as your marketing strategy? Great question. That is so a great think, question. Go for it. I yourself. think from a marketing question, and thank you so much for the feedback on the bottle. That's really, that's really helpful. Certainly. I think in terms of marketing and sharing our brand message, it's there's first the presence on social media, right? We're rolling out on social media and online. So when we first roll out online, people get the story from our website and that's communicated there. There is, you know, a definite need to communicate it at more of the retailer and bar level. And I think that takes more education on our end to really educate the people at the stores and at the local bars to, you know, when someone's thinking of what type of tequila they want to order, if we can communicate to the staff at the store during tastings and kind of have you know, a really educated person serving the alcohol, it would be great. That's also part of why we're starting slow, doing a slower local community so that we can really start to build brand buzz and people share like their best kept secret. No, this, I think that's a great point. Uh, David, do you have any other? No, I... no thank you very that's much. That's great stuff because yeah, understanding the story is so so important for people to understand, you know, the story and what the thing behind the, uh, the, you know, the inspiration behind the name. Uh, Liz, do you have any questions or feedback? Yes. Liz? Okay, uh, I think we lost hey, Liz. Can so, I jump uh, in, okay. Elaine? Oh yeah, Monique, please do. I gotta tell you too, I didn't understand the story. I wanted to come into this blind. I wanted to just come in and like give you guys the four minutes. The story actually gave me goosebumps. I'm not exaggerating. I have definitely been in that space, but I'm disappointed that none of that's on the bottle. And you know, I think even coming out of a pandemic, you don't necessarily have the opportunity right now to do a tasting or be educating the retail. So you know, definitely a shelf talker, QR code, something like that. Um, my question for you is what price point do you see this hitting? Because when you get to the Añejo level and, and especially kind of the a bit more established Cristalino brands, you get quite expensive. So I'd like to know your price point and then I've got another follow-up question. Sure. So, and we did actually experiment with QR codes on our bottle because we thought that that would be really helpful. When we were actually doing the label, it it was printing so small it wasn't it would register in our um design but then it wouldn't register in the sample and so that's definitely kind of for bottle version two we really want to add that back in because we agree that it would be really helpful to kind of have that direct bridge um in terms of the price point so our tequila is priced at 78 dollars per bottle this is definitely um lower price than kind of the brands that everyone who's kind of in our generation aspires to have, right? There's kind of the Clase Azul, which is around 150, the 1942, which is one, around 180, Casa Draconis, 130 to 150. And those are, you know, some of the brands that people our age kind of aspire to have on their bar cart among, you know, many other smaller brands. And we really feel like the Pink Pig is meant to be enjoyed and not rationed out. And so for our target demographic, those higher price ranges are a little bit more of the like rationed out bottles versus what you really want to share with your friends and enjoy. So we really think that the Pink Pig is a premium tequila, but it's more approachably priced. And um, it's really like the tequila of the next generation. I, no, I, love that. I mean, it's, it's still Go premium. Ahead, I would on your second version of the bottle, I would get away from this. This to me is like everybody's starter bottle when you're getting into spirits. So I can't wait till you guys get into a bespoke bottle with that <laughs> QR code that's more supportive of the price point you're asking for. Thank you so much, Noni. Unfortunately, that's going to be our last question uh, for uh, Autumn and Marissa. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Renee Paz from Mezcal Karim uh, Mucho, uh, which is a signature handcraft mezcal designed in the 18th century um, for Hacienda Gregorian, not sorry, produced in 18th century Hacienda Gregorian, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, located in the San Pedro Taviche Municipality, Ocalan de Morales District in Oaxaca, Mexico. So Renee, please tell us about your mezcal. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. My name is Renee Bass. I'm co-founder of Mezcal Karim Mucho. 
Thank you for this great opportunity. I'm absolutely excited about being here. Um, Quereme mucho means love me a lot. And love is a starting point of this amazing story about the most beautiful bottle in the world. It all started in the 19th century when my great great grandfather, Frank Skidmore, and his son Charles came from Texas to Oaxaca and acquired two haciendas, one named Beneficio Viejo, dedicated to the mining business, and Hacienda Gegorene to the mezcal production. In the early 20th century, my great grandmother, Maria Jimenez, developed the skills as maestro mezcalero and started producing handcraft mezcal for family consumption. The Hacienda is located in the Central Valley region, cradle of the uh, famous Oaxacan tradition, gastronomy, mezcal, and handcraft. Being one of the most uh, famous, the magical creature called Los Alebrijes. Quiereme mucho is a land to the bottle project conceived in 2011 by my uncle Eduardo Munoz Cano Skidmore and myself to preserve the family legacy of mezcal production. This project was founded under three pillars, social impact, environmental sustainability, and the Oaxacan traditions. Regarding the social impact, we employ more than 100 artisans from local villages around the Hacienda. Each bottle has the artist's name printed and is painted by their own style and design. Quereme Mucho is committed to promote their art around the world. The community has been uh, positively impacted by having a worthy and stable job, which permits them and their families to live with dignity and avoid migrating to search for a better life. We are in the final process of creating the nonprofit foundation Quereme Mucho Mas, which will be focused on fundraising from people who love our art and help the local communities in Oaxaca. About the environmental sustainability, by painting glass bottles as alebrijes, these communities stop deforesting the copal forest. The, co the, co uh, the copal wood is used to handcraft alebrijes, but this tree takes about 100 years to, mat to mature. Therefore, by protecting the forest, we're also helping the preservation of the bat colonies living in our lands that are critical for pollination. Additionally, we have installed beehives around the hacienda to improve pollination and protect the biosphere. We are also protecting the wild agaves reserve inside the hacienda to preserve the natural production of these kind of plants, like, for example, tepestate, tobala, and quiche, among others. Every year, we invest in planting thousands of agave plants in our land. This year, we have reached 22,000. Finally, the tradition. Quereme mucho is a result of bringing together two of the most important Mexican traditions, mezcal and alebrijes. On the next step, regarding our production, we rebuilt our distillery inside the Hacienda, also known as Palenque, which by the way is named El Palenque de la Abuela, a Grandma's Distillery, where we produce a 100% handcrafted spirit. It is important to highlight that the water that we employ uh, is, uh, uh, comes directly from a spring inside the Hacienda. Our bottling plant is located in Oaxaca City, where we employ only women to provide them an opportunity. In 2017, the first bottles of Quereme Mucho arrived in the US. And from then, we have been awarded several times on blight tasting <clears throat> and packaging. Today, our sales have reached 23 states in North America. We have a lot of content to communicate and educate the consumers from the plant, the process, the harvest, painting art, traditions, culture, variety of flavors, and the added value of personalized bottles, which very few brands can do. Quiero and maybe mucho 30 seconds. shocked the spirits industry because it's probably the only spirit available in the US market with a premium handcraft liquor and a unique and unrepeatable feel and touch bottle. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm pleased to hear all your questions. Renee, thank you so much. And we're gonna start with Ivy, not Liz. Sorry, Ivy. Uh, <laughs> this time, uh, Ivy, would love to hear some of your questions and feedback. First of all, thank you, Renee. Really enjoyed um, sampling both of the bottles that I received. Um, I guess my question would be um, how um, you source these artists for the bottles and kind of um, the range of your line of spirits and um, their different aging processes and things like that. Just kind of a brief overview of the wine and um, as far as aging and the different artists on each bottle and if they represent um, any certain message that the customer is um, meant to uh, be conveyed. Yeah. yeah, Ivy, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the mezcal is a very um, 
small category right now, but it's growing really fast. And, and the beautiful about uh, mezcal is that we have around 40 different plants where you can produce mezcal. In our line, we have four. We have espadín, we have tobala, we have quiche, and we have tepestate. The three, the three last ones are wild agaves. That means that they are, are grown naturally in the mountains and in specific regions in Mexico. And, and what we need to do to communicate to the consumers is the specific characteristics of each of these plants, because basically you are drinking a different plant every time you drink a different kind of agave. Uh, regarding the age, for example, at the Pestate, which I, I believe is the king of agaves, it, it takes around 50, 25 years in the land when you take it out and you process it to produce mezcal. So basically you're drinking a 25 year old plant, which in, in other categories as whiskey, for example, is the, the amount of years they spend in a barrel. So basically an espadín takes around seven, a narroqueño uh, uh, seven years old to, to, to produce mezcal. So it depends on the, on the, on the different plants. And, and as I said, we have a big, big labor in front of us to communicate and to educate the consumers to appreciate all these different possibilities you have with mezcal. Oh, fantastic. Um, Ivy? I just wanted to say, re enjoyed them very much. And the, um, the artwork is beautiful. I think, um, you know, only employing women artisans is something that um, is really awesome and uh, trailblazing, leading the way. Absolutely. Much, Nick, we haven't heard from you. Nick, what are your thoughts? I uh, just had a quick question on on uh, the lineup, and thank you again for the samples, Renee. Um, is there is it just the espadine that you guys are cultivating and and have on your land, and you're going out and sourcing those wild agaves? Could you explain that a little bit better, please? Yeah, definitely. No, we are we are planting three different kinds of, of agave right now. We are planting arroqueño, we are planting uh, tobala, and we are planting espadín. Inside the Hacienda, we have around 20,000 uh, plants that are, have, have, been, have grown up in there. And, and the plants we have already in the Hacienda are Quiche, Tepestate, and Tobala. This is, uh, uh, we have a registry by the Consejo Regulador del Mezcal. They have gone, they, they have uh, attended the Hacienda and, and made all this uh, counting on all, all these plants. And, and the idea is to take care of them because uh, this kind of uh, wild agaves are being very appreciated. And the thing is they, they take a lot of time to grow and, and we need to take care of them. But basically those are the three kinds of agaves we have been planting. Renee, Ray, uh, you look I'm like you're uh, jumping off your seat. Yeah, <laughs> stuff. Um, I got one minute. Incredible proposition, beautiful package. Was wondering what's the price progression and how are you telling the story as to are they all at the same price? Is there a price progression based on on the uh, the agave source as well as as well as how are you getting the story out there as to the difference between Kirsch and Espalin and, and so forth? And Renee, we have yeah, thirty seconds. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, de depending on the kind the, the kind of agave, we have different prices. From Espalin that comes are on a retail price around seventy dollars to Tepestati, which we are uh, around the 120. It all depends on the kind of plan. And our strategy has gone uh, on-premise and off-premise off on, we, our, at the core of our strategy is the, the, the feel and touch. You need to, to have the bottle in your hands to understand what are we talking about. Um, and, 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 and basically we have uh, applied a lot of strategies, but this is basically what I think. You, you need to, as you judge that you have the bottles, is when you get impressed about this product. Great, great questions, everybody. And thank you so much, Renee. Uh, we are now halfway through our brands presenting today. So I hope you're enjoying hearing from all of them and all of the feedback from the judges. Next up, we have Humberto Herbera from Tequila Mandela. Uh, tequila Mandela is a beautiful combination of tradition, art, and the pleasure of tequila. Uh, Humberto, please share uh, with us more about your beautiful bottles and the story of your tequila. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh -oh. I'm the co-founder of Tequila Mandala, and this is my partner, Heidi Wild. Um, can you guys hear us? Yes. Oh, okay. 
so just a little bit about our brand. Um, our brand was born and launched November 16, 2016. Uh, it was founded by myself, uh, Umberto Ibarra, my partner and uh, my cousin. Uh, um, 2000, we've been in the industry for about 11, 12 years now. And in 2014, me and my cousin Arturo Lomeli were looking to develop a brand after launching uh, several brands and developing brands for other people into the US market. Um, come around 2014, we partner up with our current uh, producer and partner, Joel Garcia Barreto. A little bit about Joel and his family. They're known for growing uh, great quality agave in El Grullo, Jalisco, which is about two hours away from Guadalajara. Um, he had approached us at the time when we were trying to develop our own brand and uh, send us some samples of uh, some really great tequila he had. Um, he had the opportunity with his agave at the time with the fluctuation of agave prices every 10 years, uh, they were kind of being lowballed for, for, for the pricing of their great quality agave. So their dad gave him the opportunity uh, to rent a distillery and uh, start producing tequila versus giving their agave away. And that's kind of how the formula for Mandala was born. Uh, he sent me over some samples and in the process, we had the same idea, the same vision to introduce something into the US, a uh, unique profile. Uh, we kind of wanted to start backwards with our tequila. We had the entire line available, which was the Blanco, the Repo, the Añejo and the Extra Añejo but we launched backwards with the extra Añejo because Joel had just bought ceramics plant and uh, Morelos, um, kind of playing with some ideas with different names and the concept. Um, we went with Mandala because it represents uh, something that represents us as a team to come together a perfect circle uh, through many trials and tribulations of being in the industry, some good times, some bad times. We felt that it had the best meaning for what it represents for us, which is to come together as a team, to come together over a bottle of mandala uh, with friends, family, loved ones. Uh, but more than anything, we wanted to introduce something unique and Joel had created something really special uh, with this concept and design and the handcrafted, uh, handcrafted, uh, hand-painted bottle. Um, but, um, more than anything, Alberto, you have one minute. One more than anything, the the uniqueness of the profile he created with the uh, with the blend of red wine and a cognac barrel, um, allowing us to create and introduce a profile that's good for sipping, eating meat, and uh, just enjoy enjoy it in general with uh, friends and family. Uh, but that's kind of how Mandala was born in our concept and how we introduced it into the market. Uh, this year, it'll be five years we've been in the market, had some uh, um, great success with our product. Uh, but yeah, that's our Mandala story. Fantastic. Well done. Um, now, thank you, Roberto. Uh, I'm going to bring it to you. Ken, you haven't had a chance to ask any uh, questions yet so uh, and give some feedback. Sounds good. Look. Thank you guys. Um, this is a definitely a beautiful bottle, great tequila. I wanted to know the sustainability and um, the potential that you guys have for this, along with what your shelf price is for this extra Yeho, um, and what what other um, SKUs you guys will have coming out in the future if, if you don't already have them out. Yeah. So. Uh, I think right now our biggest setback, to be honest, is the bottle in itself. Um, we have the capacity to produce uh, consistently 3,000 bottles a month. Um, and we have for the last six months. Uh, we're working on ramping up to 5,000 bottles a month of just the extra Añejo by itself, uh, since they're all handcrafted and hand-painted. Uh, right now, the price point is between $149, $159.99. Uh, it is a one liter bottle. Um, but that I, I would say that would be our biggest setback, the, the handcrafted bottle and, and the production. So uh, how long We're is this? In the market, uh, the Blanco, the Repo, and the Añejo do come in. A... What was that? Sorry about that. 
Sorry, so you, you, what we you cut out for a second and I thought you were done. I was just asking how long this extra day ho um, is aged in the combination of barrels. This is a total of seven years. Seven years. Our extra yet was a seven year in a one liter bottle. It's a fantastic spirit. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Appreciate thank you so it. much, thank Ken. You. Um, Nick, uh, do you have any uh, questions or feedback for Humberto? Yeah, Humberto, thank you very much uh, for sending along the samples. Um, how many markets in the US are you guys currently uh, distributed in? Uh, currently, we're available in California, Arizona, Texas, and Indiana, and talks with a distributor in Nevada. Fantastic. Um, Ray, do you have any questions or feedback? Gotcha. Um, as far as future uh, line expressions, like, do you foresee yourself just playing in that extra añejo uh, segment, or do you find yourself having different or unique expressions as uh, as Arturo has done with some of his projects? Uh, and could you share with us what the future scalability of the brand is? Will you have will you have uh, something at a tier above, and also at a at a recruitment tier, perhaps at a lower, at a, at a more attainable price point to introduce people to uh, the Mandala. Yeah, so we do have the entire line. Um, our Blanco starts at about $45.99, Reposado $49.99, our Añejo about $69.99, those $750 ml bottles, glass packaging, six packs. Um, our extra Añejo is the only one that comes in the ceramic bottle and it's a four pack one liter bottle. But um, I think for a one liter bottle, a seven year extra in Yejo, 149 with 159, it's, uh, I think it's a, a great attainable price, but we do have those other options with the Blanco, the Repo and the Añejo. Uh, personally, the one that I consume the most, I drink more of the Blanco more than anything. That's one of my favorites. I think it's, a, it's an incredible profile that Joel created. Um, it's a sipping tequila from our Blanco all the way to our extra añejo. Fantastic. Well done. I'm Monique. I know you had some questions, but unfortunately we have uh, <laughs> very wrapped up uh, in time. So um, thank you so much. Uh, now on to our fifth contender. We have Rene Valdez from Tequila Honor. Um, Tequila Honor is a creative, uh, authentic, relevant, 100% agave, ultra premium artisanal tequila. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love this line, empowering the consumers to live life with honor. Renee, please tell us about your tequila. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be with you. Lots to talk about, so let's jump into it. The world's becoming smaller and smaller due to health, political, social, economic unrest. Consumers are gravitating towards brands that are relevant, creative, and have a genuine positive message. From a relevance perspective, we're the only tequila that has been born through social media. The consumer shows the cap and the neck label that we ended up producing. Due to that and other reasons, we have over 164,000 followers, more than all tequila brands with exception of five, even bigger than global brands like Jim Beam, Bacardi, Bombay, and others. It is no coincidence that our brand name is short, easy to remember, easy to pronounce, works in English and Spanish. It is no coincidence that our packaging is in Spanish. Research told us that consumers think it's more authentic and gave us more authority. We have an anchor in English and of course our website is bilingual. From a creative perspective, most tequilas launch Blanco, Reposado, so on. We crafted our liquids to satisfy the needs of consumers. I can elaborate more on your questions, but also to go after different channels of distribution. We're the only tequila that each of our expressions have a unique brand name and personality. Honor Blanco Reflexion for bonding. Honor Afilado High Proof Reposado for liberation and mixology. Honor Afirmación Añejo for discernment. Many tequila brands focus on elaborate bottles. For us, the most important thing is the liquid and the label. As you can see, we have purposely hidden different icons throughout the label. Each of those icons tells everyone's journey through life in search of honor, as well as the tequila that we have now and future tequilas to come. 
Uh, from a packaging standpoint, we upgraded it to provide something higher quality to our consumers, higher quality glass, but most important to deliver our positioning. As you can see here, it says honor is in your hands. On the back label, we have two audiences, the consumer and the trade, where we talk about the production process. We work with a small artisanal distillery, have been awarded numerous awards for quality, such as for the Blanco Best of Show. From a positive message, everything that we do is to empower consumers to live a life of honor. Everyone, regardless of where you're from or religious background, consciously or unconsciously, we try to live a good life. We walk the talk. Three years ago, there was an earthquake in Mexico and we helped a local organization to fund it. Uh, last year, we helped a group of US farmers during COVID. This year, we're helping a group of artisans the original creators of the Alebrijes. So regardless if you're a retailer, bartender, mixologist, distributor, consumer, you clearly understand what we stand for because we all are searching for that. As cherry on top, we have a fourth expression that is unique to the US. Also one of the co-founders is one of Mexico's most famous celebrity. She has helped us get product placement on national networks as well as on Netflix. But most importantly, she's genuinely passionate about tequila because she clearly understands the culture, which is critical for a category that has to come from Mexico. It is no coincidence that Kay is part of the team because nowadays, of course, more women are drinking tequila. But at the end 30, of the day, what 20 seconds. is that we try <laughs> to empower consumers to live a good life and from everyone to realize that honor is in their hands. Thank you very much. Wow, what a great what a great story! It really does sound like you live up to your your name, and it has a great marketing strategy. Uh, Monique, I would love to start with you. Um, start with any feedback or questions. Sure. Thanks, Elaine. And thank you so much. What a great presentation. I, I have to start off by commending you. I'm very close with the Bibanco family and work with a lot of their tequila. And for me, if you're Blanco tequila, your production methods, things aren't transparent and, and real. Um, I don't really care what kind of bottle you put it in or what you do with it. And this Blanco tequila, I mean, it's just a really beautiful expression. You alluded to the fact that you've got um, an expression that's going to be completely unique to the U.S. Can you expand on that fourth expression for me? Yes, we, we currently have it in the market. I did not send it because I didn't want to overwhelm everyone and also was concerned that I wasn't going to have time to talk about it. We were the first in the world clear reposado. There have been Dobel, which is a blend of Reposado, Añejo, and Extrañejo. We were the first 100% clear Reposado and still are in the U.S. And as you will know, this category, uh, it was crafted for a different audience, for someone that doesn't have a lot of experience with tequila, for younger consumers, for female consumers. Uh, but obviously, it's a, it's a unique. And we went with the Reposado side because it's a nice balance of not too much wood, not too much agave. The original ones were the Blanco, the High Proof, and the Redención, Clear Reposado, because like I said, we crafted the tequila based on the consumer's needs. So this one is for those people that are looking for a more uh, status, that want to have more uh, unique experience, something more uh, subtle and elegant. Well, of course, the High Proof Reposado is for more the traditional tequila experiences, party, you know, all night and drinking and dancing on tables, that sort of thing. This one is, of course, you know, 83 proof. And the Blanco is more like bonding where you're chilling at a nice Irish pub, you know, watching the, the football game, that sort of thing. So these were the original ones based, again, on uh, the needs of consumers and to provide something unique to the trade. So there's only one other like this one, which is Patron Roca. We actually launched at the same time. And this one, you cannot find a clear reposado. Obviously, you have the añejos and extrañejos that are clear. Great, great question and great presentation. David, I know you have a question. Saw your hands up there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first, Rene, let me tell you, your attention to detail on your packaging, that label is, uh, it was no waste of time. I think that was incredibly uh, well crafted and thought out. And as a distributor, which, which I am, we look for things that help get it into the consumer's hands pulled off of the shelf or asked for in the bar. And while not everything resonates with everyone, you put so many cool little details into your package, you're probably gonna resonate with someone on something. That really helps our job in getting that brand out and distributed. 
so it has a chance in the marketplace. So I applaud that effort. It was fantastic. Thank Secondly, you. the juice. Uh, the best accolade I can give a spirit is to call it dangerous. Your Blanco is seriously dangerous. It's just, <laughs> it feels like it's half water in the glass, which is really, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a sense of, of poor diluted flavor. I mean, it is so smooth. It is so easy to drink. You can sip it neat. Uh, you could throw it in, in a drink and it'll keep the cocktail the way it should be. I'm really, really impressed with, with uh, your Blanco. My question for you is, this thing starts to take off. People really start to pull it. How is your supply and what are your ramp up efforts capability? Yeah, we're, and you have 45 uh, we're, seconds, Renee. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like I was saying, we're working with a beautiful family, the Vivanco family. Uh, they have the capacity for 4,000 liters a day. They're currently 30% uh, percent capacity. So it's just a matter of planning, uh, proper planning. We're still self-funded. Uh, it's a project of my wife and I, and I apologize if this, you know, right falls because I'm actually on a family vacation. So if you hear kids around, uh, I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, but yeah, so it's basically at the end of the day, just proper planning. And obviously as an entrepreneur, it's just being very interesting and ever racking going through, unfortunately running out of product, but I guess that's a good problem to have. And, but we're, we're gonna be able to secure funding towards the end of this year as we're getting more aggressive towards that area. Thank you so much, Renee. That was such a great, impressive presentation. All right, so now on to our final contender Thank for you. Tequila and Mezcal Tournament, um, Fran Vivenzio from Tequila Cam Camosario. Uh, uh, tequila Camosario is an award-winning ultra premium tequila that uses recently discovered and recreated recipes, that, which is a state grown in the highlands of Jalisco. Fran, please tell us more about your tequila. Good morning and thank you everyone. It must be afternoon in your places, but um, good to see everybody. And thank you for allowing me to present to you. Um, tequila Commissario. So in, in essence, Commissario means the commissioner. Um, and in a brief story, way back when, when King George III ruled over uh, the indigenous people of Mexico, um, they didn't allow, there was a, uh, there was a um, basically a prohibition against the people from producing tequila because he wanted to collect taxes um, for, for his uh, kingdom. Anyway, a, a, the commissioner or probably what you would be more the sheriff that kind of guarded the area, um, what he would do is when the conquistadors would come and visit, uh, he, would, he would actually alert the people that uh, the conquistadors were coming, they'd hide their stills and hide their tequila. That's a big brief story. I know we only have four minutes. Anyway, in, um, in, in really in, um, uh, to, to bring some, some um, esteem to the commissioner, they named a tequila after him, which is Commissario. Um, but that's just the story. What we are, okay, we're in a state grown uh, line of tequilas. Um, the estate is owned by the Aceves family, who is our partners in, uh, in Mexico. Our president and CEO, Luis Cota, is a dual citizen. So uh, we're able to be a true partnership with the Aceves brothers in, uh, in Mexico. Some of our, our key points, we utilize about nine kilos of agave per liter of tequila. Um, what, what does that do? It really gives us a true essence of agave and also allows our agave to come through in all three of our expressions, our Reposado, our Añe and our Añejo, uh, besides our, uh, you know, our uh, Blanco. Um, most of your, what I would call the ultra premium categories are utilizing three and a half to maybe four um, kilos of agave per uh, per liter of tequila. So we find that that you know that's the way we wanted to produce our brand. Um, that wasn't me. So anyway, a couple of other things we do. We we have some uh, we have proprietary stills that were actually designed by uh, Jose Aceves. Uh, Jose is not only a a third generation master distiller, but he's also an engineer. Um, we, util we utilize, um, we, we utilize a, an autoclave system, so we cook, but some things we do different. We 
we cook for about 24 hours, but then we cool for about 24 hours. What does that do? It brings back all the flavors in, and I like to describe it as you make a lasagna or you make a chili, it always tastes better the next day. And finally, in our production process, our claim to fame is we, we um, use an oxygenation process. We pump oxygen for 36 hours through 5,000 liters at a time. This breaks down the alcohol into about 1,000 parts. Um, so it's really, it, it, what it does, it doesn't change the agave. It doesn't change any of the flavoring, but it really produces a very soft and creamy mouthfeel. Um, quickness, we age our, our Reposado in, um, um, in American oak uh, bourbon barrels for seven months. Our Añejo stays in those barrels for 19 months. Then we take it out and we put it into California Cabernet barrels for an additional four months. Okay. Renee, we're about to wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I just wanted to show you one thing. We produced this as a Day of the Dead bottle for last year. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and we are producing a special package for this year for, for a Day of the Dead celebration. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off there. Um, okay. We're at the end. So judges, I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, Nick, you look like you had some things that you wanted to uh, give some thoughts and some feedback. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Fran, for the uh, samples. And um, can you touch on the price points of these? Uh, yeah, we're we are in the ultra premium category. So our Blanco is going to be in the 44 to $46 range. Our, our Reposado will be 47 to $49.99. And our Añejo probably 59 to $64.99. Great. Ivy, did you have some uh, some thoughts to add? I did. Um, I really enjoyed all three bottlings, especially the Reposado and the Añejo. Um, they really have this really um, kind of vanilla caramel note, especially the Añejo from being aged extra long in those barrels. Um, and really on the bottle, I like how you kind of have the medallion here almost looks like the bottle is wearing a little metal and also the um, certification of hand bottling. I think that a lot of ultra, you know, consumers in the ultra premium tequila market are looking for those hand bottled, um, handcrafted tequilas and especially um, estate grown. So yeah. really enjoyed all three tequilas. Thank you, Fran. You're welcome. One of, one, of our, uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up, the last time we'd had a live at WSWA was in 2019, and our Reposado took a double gold. Um, we did quite well in that competition. In fact, uh, I think that's what brought David to our, 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 um, our booth to come and visit <laughs> us and take a look at our brands. So anyway. Fantastic. Ken, you look like you had some uh, thoughts to add to the table. What's your feedback? Thank you, Fran, for the samples. I appreciate them. Um, I was thinking, okay. out of the three bottles, there seems to be two different label designs. And I was just wondering if one was an older or newer. One kind of um, has the ultra. The, the other just says 100% agave. Yeah, the um, we're going through a slight package change with our with all three, but. As you know, uh, Blanco is about 60% of our of, of the business. So um, the Blanco package has not upgraded yet, up, uh, changed where the Añejo and the Reposado have. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Monique, do you have any thoughts or feedback? Grant, these are great. And thank you for, for sharing all of this and great information. So you talked about this kind of proprietary, um, like proprietary recipe and going back to these proprietary pieces. Is that in the still or in the oxygenation? Like what was this that would have been used, you know, 150 years ago that you guys have, have brought back? <laughs> um, I, you know, I honestly think it's it more proprietary falls into um, the estate grown. OK, you're not going to find a lot of estate grown tequilas out there uh, with our partners, the uh, Civis family. Uh, they, they control quite a bit of agave. And that, that's really where it starts. The, the other proprietary things are really our stills, um, our Alembic style stills. Uh, they're, they're stainless steel with copper, copper coils. So I, I guess that would give you more of the proprietary stuff. Other people are doing the oxygenation um, process. Uh, we didn't invent it. I think we kind of um, really made it so 
Um, I mean, it's very obvious in our finishes uh, that that that's what's creating that finish. So we have time for one more quick question, David. What brought you over to his booth? I guess <laughs> you seem familiar with sure, this. Brand. Thanks a lot. Well, sure, it, it was heavily accoladed and, and definitely something that you did not want to ignore when you go to the WSWA and has so many choices in uh, in products. What we liked when we tasted the product was, and I'm sure anyone tasting this knows that it's so approachable, so smooth, right up the line. Um, all three that that we're tasting here today are very, very smooth and easy to drink, especially for a newcomer into the category. And so many new people are coming onto the category. The, the only thing I, I wish for this brand moving forward is that it gets even more notoriety, more uh, brand backing, marketing efforts, and get more people to understand what this brand brings to the uh, to the table, because there are so many other brands out there that are making it into this space. Uh, you want to make sure that this thing cuts through the clatter and has its chance, because it's fantastic juice. Really, really appreciate it, Fran. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Those are great comments. Uh, that, that is the end of our competitors. That wraps it up. So I just want to say thank you uh, to all the competitors and judges. Uh, we're now going to send the uh, esteemed panel of judges off to decide uh, you know, the difficult task of who is going to be the winner and who is going to move on to the championship round on September 14th. Um, and while that is happening, I would like to introduce uh, Dale Stratton and we're going to, I'm looking forward to hearing his update on today's category. We're all, and while he presents, uh, we're gonna ask you, the audience, to actually vote, uh, to vote on your uh, people's choice. So what is your, uh, your favorite brand? Um, the company with the most voice, uh, votes from the audience will be our People's Choice winner. Um, now, Dale, uh, tell us what the SIP source data shows for this category. Elaine, thank you very much. And at the, at the start of this, you mentioned that uh, it's a very competitive category. And not only is it a competitive category, but it's a very, very hot category as well. So uh, this is looking at overall and a time series from SIP source. And for those of you who don't know what SIP source is, it's an aggregation of depletion data from the major wholesalers and a lot of wholesalers across the country. It's a great representation for what's happening in the three teams. <clears throat> Spirits are doing very well. That's the top line. You can see that they're growing at 7.2%. These are 12 month rolling numbers while wine is now down 1.4%. Next slide, please. Uh, we all know what happened with the on-premise and that the on-premise took a big hit uh, with the shelter in place during COVID. On the left-hand side, you can see this is spirits. On the right-hand side, that is wine, looking at the break between on and off-premise. And you can see here that the uh, in spirits, on-premise is down 29.3%, but we've really started to see that come back and we expect to see those really jump back. Wine is lagging a little bit. Some of that could be that we're seeing uh, uh, on-premise accounts restock their bars, bring things back in. This is something we're gonna watch very closely to see how both of these come back, but we do see a good recovery starting in the on-premise. Next slide, please. Uh, tequila is hot and tequila has been hot. And I was a little nervous about tequila at the start of, uh, uh, at the, start of the pandemic, ma mainly based on its uh, leverage against the on-premise and we'll talk about that. Other than pre-mixed cocktails, which are growing at a phenomenal 73.4%, you can see here that, te that, that the tequila agave category is growing 16.6%. Very, very strong growth. And that growth has been sustained over the long term. Tequila in volume in that is now bigger than rum. Uh, uh, and uh, that is absolutely huge for this category to speak about where that has gone and how it's grown. Next slide. We saw here with Mezcal and Mezcal a year ago was really outperforming tequila and traditional tequila. But with the pandemic, we saw that, that that Mezcal really took a hit. We'll talk about why that is on the next slide. But the important point is that we're seeing Mezcal come back and we're starting to see that good growth in Mezcal as well as within the tequila category. Next slide. And really what happened here, the, the left-hand side looks at April of 2020, the right-hand side looks at uh, April of 2021. And I, and, what we saw here is that within Mezcal, it was at this time a 50-50 split 
between on and off premise. Very strong trial in the on premise, very good growth in the on premises uh, as well as the off premise, it was just starting to move. When the pandemic hit, it just lost that on-premise business. And you can see on the right-hand side that that on-premise business for uh, Mezcal is down 34.5%. When we look at tequila, tequila has actually done pretty well in the on-premise uh, and, and has maintained better than we thought. Net of it is the category remains hot. Next slide, please. If we look at it from a price segment standpoint, we, we Tequila is unique in the fact that not only is the ultra premium, the highest price point growing the fastest, it's the largest category, uh, the largest price segment within the category. Great growth in, in the ultra premium segment. The consumer continues to drink premium and purchase premium. Great news for the, for, for the tequila category and we expect that to continue. Next slide, please. Then we look at it from a regional standpoint and looking at this from various ge geographies. And this uh, is looking at tequila on the left-hand side of the graph. Mezcal is on the right-hand side of the graph. And we know that um, really a lot of the, the strength of tequila has uh, started on uh, in the West, was a little bit stronger. The South Central in, in Texas and up through that did well. But we can see that the growth rates across other parts and moving across the country are very, very strong for tequila. When we get over to the Mezcal side of things, it's a little bit, little bit choppier. Uh, Mezcal is finding its way, certainly a little bit more popular uh, in, in the Western side, but we're seeing good growth for Mezcal now start to spread out. And really the only uh, 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 region that is, that is lagging is the Northeast being down 3.4%. But we'd expect to see Mezcal's uh, uh, popularity grow and continue to get strong. With that, I think that was the last slide. I will turn it over for the moment we've all been waiting for. Congratulations to all the participants, great job. And if you uh, can see there from Nicole Anderson, please visit sipsource.com to get more information. Back to you, Elaine. Okay. Thank you, Dale, for that uh, incredible information. Uh, before we announce the winners, uh, I would love for all of the uh, contenders and the judges to put back on their cameras. And then Nicole. Okay. okay, is everybody on? All right, so uh, we are going to, all right, so first up is our People's That's Choice winner. Too that all of our viewers selected. Are you excited? Right, <laughs> so the People's Choice winner for tequila and mezcal category is? <laughs> okay, there you go. It is uh, Karim Mucho Mezcal. Congratulations, that is fantastic. What a beautiful bottle, what a great contender, uh, what intense competition, um, and you really did an amazing job. How excited are you? Um, I'm absolutely excited. Thank you very much. This is incredible. <laughs> is it, is the, behind this project, there are so many people, so many artists and so many women. Yeah, my family, my family legacy, and, and, and this is amazing. This is basically, to see the result of hard work and, and teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah, well done and well said, well said. So, well, this is incredible, very, very exciting stuff. Um, all right, I think uh, the next up is we're going to announce the judges. All right, so are you ready, everybody? So now the judges' choice of best category winner um, who's going to proceed to the Brand Battle Championship on September 14th. And the winner is... <laughs> it is uh, Kirill Mucho Tequila uh, Mezcal. <laughs> wow, again. <laughs> wow. What fantastic wow, wow. news. I mean, really, to win two, that is an incredible feat. Uh, you just must be over the moon. And it's really well yeah, deserved. I'm, 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 I'm speechless. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
as, as you can see, every bottle is different. Every bottle has the signature of the artist that, that paint this bottle. They all come from very poor communities in Oaxaca and we are promoting the, that they paint glass and that they uh, just express a, as an artist in a bottle and then bringing this to other countries, especially to the US where, where people really uh, understand what the mezcal is. And now we are bringing all these handcraft uh, bottles to their houses where you can use it even after drinking the mezcal as a flower base or whatever you want. So <laughs> I'm so happy and, and, I, I, and I need to thank obviously uh, my uncle Eduardo and all the people behind this project because we work on a daily basis so hard and, and, and this is an amazing achievement for everyone. And thank you very much for the opportunity to the WSWA and all the judges. And, and we really hope you enjoy the spirit and obviously this piece of art. Well, really big congratulations to you on your win. There was some really tough competition here today. Each one gave an incredible presentation. So they were all really proud. So, but you, yeah, this is incredible. So, and, and well-deserved, they are beautiful bottles. I, I look forward to having mine in my house and using as a flower vase uh, one day after I <laughs> have some uh, of this delicious uh, mezcal. So well done. All right. So just so everybody knows, uh, knows uh, just so you know, uh, the awards will ma mail to you next week, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, I really want to thank all of the contenders who participated today. I hope you had a great uh, experience and received some really valuable feedback. And for everyone viewing, uh, all the contenders' information can be found uh, online at the Brand Battle Directory. Uh, the link to the directory is actually has been placed in the chat box, but you can also find it on the tournament website. Uh, we want to make sure that you're all aware, but especially the members of the media in attendance, that there will be a category winner uh, virtual press briefing following the broadcast, uh, where you get to hear from today's uh, winner about their experience, be able to ask uh, any questions and support your reporting. So you'll find the link to this briefing in the chat box or email Christina at WSWA or for more information. Um, but again, you guys all, everybody here did an incredible job. So thank you so much. And you should be all incredible, incredible work. Thank you. All right, so again, we wanna thank our sponsors of today's tournament, 750 uh, Beverage Media Group, as well as our other tournament uh, sponsors. Um, and we really do hope you enjoy today's uh, program uh, and watch our tournaments uh, every Tuesday, the competition this summer. Next week, we'll hear from contenders from a very exciting category the RTD and hard seltzers. So register at the link in the chat box or online today to save your seat. And um, until then, have a great week. <laughs>